Hi there. In this video, I'm going to give you some brief advice on standard of coverage. And what I mean by standard of coverage is ensuring that you provide the right level of exposition in your written assessments at degree level. In a previous video on this channel, we looked at something called the hindsight bias, which refers to our tendency to look back upon the outcome of events as being more obvious or more predictable than they actually were. Similarly, we tend to view the knowledge we've gained as being more self-evident or more obvious than it actually is. You can illustrate the hindsight bias quite easily by using the kind of brain teasers that are available online. Here's an example. Let's say you enter a house and that house has a closet. Inside the closet, there is a light bulb which illuminates the contents of the closet. Outside of the closet, there are three switches, only one of which controls the light bulb inside the closet. Your task, of course, is to figure out which of these switches controls the light bulb inside the closet. Now, of course, being a brain teaser, there are constraints on the way you go about solving the problem. You're not allowed to open the closet door and flip each switch in turn to see which one turns on the light bulb. And you also can't tell whether the light is on or off when the closet door is closed. The only thing you know is that the light bulb is initially switched off. You can flip the switches in whatever order you want, but you're not allowed to touch the switches once the door is opened. And you only get to open the door once to see the results of your actions. So with these constraints in mind, how do you go about definitively ascertaining which one of these switches turns the light bulb inside the closet on and off? If you'd like to have a go at solving this brain teaser, then please pause the video now because I'm about to give you the answer. So I'm going to put the solution to this brain teaser on the screen now. If you didn't manage to solve the brain teaser off your own back, but as you're reading this solution you think, oh my god, that's so obvious, then you're demonstrating the hindsight bias. And the reason you're demonstrating the hindsight bias is because if the solution was as obvious as you now think it is, then you would have managed to solve this brain teaser off your own back. But the point is, because you now know the solution, it's very difficult for you to objectively reflect on how difficult this particular brain teaser would be to solve without the solution being present. In effect, it's become almost impossible for you to remember what it was like to try and figure out this brain teaser before you had the answer. And that's the hindsight bias in action. Once we know something, we cannot unknow it and it becomes much more difficult for us to reflect on what it's like to be ignorant of the knowledge we now take for granted. One of the consequences of finding it difficult to reflect back on a time where you didn't know something that you now take for granted is that inability to assume that perspective of ignorance also makes it difficult for you to understand and to appreciate what it's like for someone who's yet to benefit from the learning that you've undertaken. This is sometimes referred to as the curse of knowledge. And what it basically means is that we tend to assume that the people we're communicating with have roughly the same amount of knowledge and understanding that we possess. The curse of knowledge can have a really negative effect on your writing at degree level. And that's because if you assume that the reader already knows as much about a topic as you, then you're probably not going to want to insult their intelligence by going into detail about something that they are already familiar with. But here's where you can lose a lot of marks because the whole point of assessments at degree level is that you demonstrate to an intelligent but uninformed person how much you know and understand about a particular topic. And the curse of knowledge can be a real impediment to you doing this. If you look at the text that appears on the screen now, you can see that the author of this text has made the assumption that the reader is already familiar with the study by Rogge in 2010. The problem with this, of course, is what the author should have been doing is providing enough detail on the Rogge 2010 study such that a reader who was not already familiar with that study could understand its significance. At the moment, based on this text, it wouldn't be possible for a reader who was intelligent but uninformed, i.e. wasn't familiar with the research of Rogge 2010, to really understand the significance of this work and its relationship to the point being made. 
Of course, it's all well and good advising you to write for an intelligent but uninformed person, but sometimes it can be difficult to know what kinds of information you should be including in your coverage. And to this end, a really good approach is to think about classifying the kind of information that a reader would need from the particular kind of source that you're using. So for example, if I were writing about a journal article that documented an experimental study, I would assume that the reader would need four types of information. First of all, they'd need information about the context for that study, i.e. the rationale, why was that study done? Secondly, they'd probably need some information about the methodology of that study, i.e. how the study was done. Thirdly, they'd want some information about what the study found, i.e. the results of the study. And finally, they'd probably want some information about the implications of that study, i.e. what the findings of that study mean in a broader context. So let's consider how we might classify the kind of information that an intelligent but uninformed person would need in order to more fully understand the Roger 2010 study that we previously referred to. If you have a look at the text that appears on screen now, you'll see that it's color coded and each color corresponds to a different type of information about that study. So in the yellow text, we have information about the context and the rationale of that study. In the white text, we have information about the methodology of the study. In the gray text, we have information about the results of the study. And in the light blue text, we have information about the implications of the study. You might want to pause the video at this point to give yourself the opportunity to read this text in more detail and press play when you're ready to continue. The thing to take away from this example is that by classifying the kind of information that an intelligent but uninformed person would need in order to make sense of your writing, you're increasing the chances that the level of coverage that you give a topic will be appropriate for someone who does not yet have your level of knowledge and understanding. The kind of classification that you use is going to depend on the subject you're studying and the type of information you want to get across. So, for example, if you were a law student and you were looking at case precedent, you might want to classify the information so that you had something on the context in which a particular case occurred, the salient details of that case, the finding of that case, and then the implication of that case for precedent. It's up to you to think about what kind of classification you want to use for the information, but in doing so, you should always bear in mind what is the bare minimum you need to get across to the reader for them to be able to understand the point that you're trying to make or the information you're trying to convey. I hope you found this video on standard of coverage helpful. If so, please do hit the like button and subscribe to my channel if you're interested in finding out more about how psychology can help you study more effectively. If you turn on the notifications, you'll get updates when I post new content. Thank you.